All right. So, uh, welcome to week three, I guess we're on. Um, technically week four, because the first week was just the kind of the, the here we go and explaining what we're doing. What we need to know is that for the next two weeks, ETA is going to look different. If you look ahead in your, maybe you're a keener and you looked ahead into the next couple weeks of study, but what you'll see is that in the next couple weeks, you're, the next two weeks, you're going to be um, continuing to share your testimony that you've begun working on, which was part of the work this week. Um, but you're going to also not, you're not going to read two chapters this next week. You're going to read the whole book again. And then you're going to track some of those themes um, in this next week. And so when you come to ETA next week, you're just going to go straight to wherever your group meets. Um, so whatever group you're, wherever, whatever room your group ends up in after the teaching time, um, today, you're going to go right back there next week, and you're going to go straight in, and you only have four questions to do next week, but you have like four times more reading or more. Um, and, and so you're going to do more reading, but you're going to begin to track some of these things like um, the I am sayings of Jesus, and wh like where are those, and, and start to kind of put that together, or even the Jewish festivals, I think, is in the next week of study, you're going to kind of take the prologue and pick it apart and jump ahead into the rest of the book and see where does the prologue become narrative or where does the word becoming flesh coming into the world become God sent his son and he had this conversation. Um, and, and so you're going to start to see that is the hope. So over the next two weeks, you're, next week when you come back, don't come into this room, just go straight to wherever you end up after this. I would love to tell you where that is, but I don't even know where all of you go. So um, that is, that's what we're going to do for the next two weeks. Trying to um, get that, get the reading piece down. Like reading is obviously important to this, but trying to, um, trying to train into us reading observantly and just seeing like, oh, that, how many of you guys have actually, I put this little box up on the top of each week about like every time you see the word life. How many of you guys have actually done that? Every time you see the word life, you tick it down. How many were there this week, Christina? Nice. It is nearly 50 times in the whole book. And so the old, like, it's pretty cool. Like eight, that's great. I didn't, I didn't count. I forgot to count. Um, but and, and so just wanting us to read observantly. So a big piece of it is observation, another piece is interpretation, and another piece is application. And so in this time, I want to do a little bit of both of those things. And so if you open your Bibles to John chapter 4, or 3, sorry, that's where we are. We're going to do most, we're going to spend most of our time, because I am going to try and keep it to that 15 minutes, I'm going to, we're going to spend our time mostly in John chapter 3. That doesn't mean that there's not things to talk about in John chapter 4, but there are, um, it's just a time thing, and I want to honor your group time a little better than I did last week. And so, when we get into John chapter 3, one thing that I wanted you to notice this week in the, it was, you, you should read the end of John chapter 2, because that sets up the rest of Jesus' interactions, even going into chapter 5 with the healing at the pool at, Beth at uh, Bethesda, or Bethsaida. And he, and he heals this man in chapter 5. And th this sets up the whole thing. We read that when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. And so far, John has really only recorded for us one sign. In the book of John, there's seven, some people say eight, but there's seven signs, like for sure, seven signs that, that John records for us. But at the end, he says, Jesus did way more than I told you about. And so it, it shouldn't come as a surprise to us that when we read... Um, We've only seen one sign. We have the wedding at Cana, the water into wine. We've only seen one sign in the book of John, but he says, now he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So Jesus is doing um, a lot of ministry. He's, he's doing more than what John has recorded for us so far. But Jesus, in, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And then what you see is, as you go through and you see the, how Jesus interacts with Nicodemus and the woman at the well and, and the officials, um, the healing of the official son, and then the man in chapter five who he heals, you, you see that he does. He goes straight to the heart. And there's an overarching theme that happens that you see in all of these conversations. And it's this. 
It's that people would way rather talk about religion than sin. That's what you get. Nicodemus wants to talk about religion. All of a sudden you get, it's a bit of a side note, but you get this discussion in chapter, in verse 25 of chapter 3. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification, religious ritual. People would rather talk about religion than talk about sin and being saved from sin. You get that with the woman at the well. She's like, Probably the, the she's she's probably the best of all of these examples. But she she you get this with the woman at the well. She's like, yeah, but we have Jacob's well, and one day we're gonna worship this way or, or, or whatever. And he's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. The hour is coming when people are gonna worship in spirit and in truth, not just here but everywhere. And so people would rather talk to Jesus about religion than sin. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I know what's in your heart, and it's and you're right. It is religion and it's sin. And I want to change that. I want you to be born again. And so you see that over and over again um, in the book of John. People would rather talk about religion than talk about sin, talk about sin issues, talk about being born again. So in order to, I want to say, in order to, um, oh, I forgot my paper on the printer again. Genia, can you run to the printer and grab my paper? Um, in order to I want to say in order to kind of piece together chapter 3 and chapter 4, I want us to start right here in chapter 3, verse 35 and 36. So if you can turn there, verse 33, or chapter 3, verse 35 and 36. The Father loves the Son, and he has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Thank you. Did it again. Um, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That is super important because when we go and we talk with Nicodemus about being born again, this is the issue right here. This sets the stage. This, in a lot of ways, explains the purpose of the conversation with Nicodemus and shoots forward into the purpose of the conversation with the woman at the well. And it explains for us the verses that we love so much, which is John 3, 16 to 21, which I had you write out. How many of you had hand cramps this week writing that out? That was a really cool practice we wanted to do. Um, we wanted you to observe, simply just write it out. We wanted you to interpret it, put it in your own words. We wanted you to apply it. I will, in response to the text, I will. And so just a really simple, like, a how-to, a tool for you as you read Scripture. But this is the key to reading chapter 3 and setting up chapter 4 and chapter 5. The motivation for creating ETA is to define the non-negotiables of discipleship and to put them into practice, to be a community that learns together, and more specifically, to be a community that learns to understand God's word and obey it together. And here in John chapter 3, Jesus is giving us like the number one non-negotiable of discipleship. You must be born again. You must. There's three musts here. There's three musts in this these couple in this chapter, and you have the must of the sinner. You must be born again. We have a must of Jesus. I can't remember where it went. We have a must of Jesus. The Son of Man must be lifted up. Sorry. The Son of Man must be lifted up. And then we have, I didn't write it down because I thought I'd remember. We have a third must, and you can find it. Um, <laughs> I, was good. I was like, oh, I'll remember that. I won't write that down. But Jesus gives us this non-negotiable of discipleship. You must be born again. Why must we be born again? Because of what we read in verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son and has eternal life, born again, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Whoever is not born again shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That's why we must be born again. Because the wrath of God remains on those who are not born again. And so this, this talking with Nicodemus is, a, is, a, is just a, a working out of that, a way that Jesus is, is getting this into his heart. We must be born again so that God in his patience doesn't only 
and, or we must be born again. And, and what's neat is that God in his patience doesn't only command it in some booming voice from heaven that we are left to like kind of reel from and discern. He, he doesn't just say, you must be born again and then walk away, right? He, he, he comes in the flesh. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us and says, no, you must be born again. Let me show you what that means. He proclaims it, he teaches it, and teaches it, and he invites us into it. These interactions in chapters 3, 4, and 5 are all Jesus making that proclamation and that inv- invitation. You must be born again. Why? Be- because by nature, we are under condemnation. That's what we read later on in 16 to 21. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And then people think there's a contradiction coming up in verse 18. Because whoever believes in him is not condemned. Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And then they, then it, but then it sounds like the world is condemned. And that's because the world is condemned. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. Think prologue. The light has come into the world. And the people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest the work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And so what you have is there's this this imperative. You must be born again. Why must we be born again? Because outside of being born again, we are condemned. It's not, Jesus doesn't come to condemn the world. This is, this is like, people, I think, get this wrong and then struggle in discipleship sometimes or struggle in evangelism sometimes, which is a thrust that we want to, we want to come out of ETA ready to share the hope that's within us, which is why you're going to work on your testimony and share it together and share it with others. Um, we come, we come, and this limits us so much because we read and we say, well, he came to seek and save the lost, or he, he didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And somehow we don't reconcile the fact that outside of him, the world is condemned. The world condemns itself by unbelief. And sometimes I think we, we sort of like mix that up and it, and it, and it gives us a bit of like, it puts a hitch in our step in evangelism. We're like, I'm not really sure, like, it, it, it takes away our motivation because we don't interact with the world is condemned outside of Christ. It's not that you're okay and then you come to Christ and then, and then, and then you're saved. It's like, no, you're condemned. The world condemns itself by its lack of belief in Christ. And so the, the main thrust of chapter three, there's all kinds of things in, in the conversation with Nicodemus. There's all kinds of things in the conversation about the groom and the bridegroom. But the main thrust of chapter three is that the world stands condemned and you must be born again. It's a non-negotiable of discipleship. That's why I'm keying on it. There's all kinds of things we could talk about in chapter three, but a non-negotiable of discipleship. You must be born again. That has to motivate our evangelism. Why should you prepare to share what God has done in your life? Because the world stands condemned in their unbelief and they must be born again. And God wants to invite you into sharing what he's done. Some cool things that I do want to talk about from Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, well, he kind of goes, he says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so there's progression. You can't see the kingdom of God and now you can't enter the kingdom of God. And so what does it mean to be born of water and spirit? There's a, there's a theme that runs through the book of John about water. And a lot of it has to do, some people look at this and they say, well, you have to be baptized and, and in the spirit. And then, and then you're saved. It's like, well, no, that's not, like baptism hasn't been projected yet. And, and so, you know, John is baptizing for repentance, but the, this believer's baptism hasn't been a thing yet. So this clearly can't be baptism. What does it mean to be born of water and the spirit? And we have to go back to the Old Testament and understand that the Jews washed for everything. It was like, it was a good deal, right? It kept sin, it kept, it kept, um, 
sickness outside of the camp. It was really practical that way. And as you read Israel's history, it's actually really interesting. Like there's all kinds of pestilence other places and they just wash so much that they're like, they actually stay pretty healthy. Practical. I just love how practical God is. Wash your hands. It's good. Um, and, but they would like wash their whole bodies in. And it was a way that they would separate themselves or consecrate themselves or prepare to worship. Prepare to worship. And so they would wash themselves. And so to be born of water and the spirit is to be, is, is drawing on that imagery of like, you are consecrated. You are made, you're made, you're transformed, you're washed, you're cleansed, you're made better. You're made ready to be in God's presence. And so it's this idea of being cleansed. Water is not baptism washing, but if you fast forward to, to verse 25, it's interesting. This seems to be the thing that Jesus is constantly debating is this washing piece. It was the, it was the reason the Pharisees didn't like John the Baptist at the beginning because he was baptizing Jews and Jews didn't need to be baptized because they would wash themselves all the time. Didn't need to happen. And it seems to be this thing that he continues to debate Then he says you have to be born of water and the spirit, meaning set apart, meaning consecrated, meaning prepared, meaning ready to dwell with God, ready to be with God. That was like a lot of it was worship and ready to be in God's presence in the Old Testament law. And so he says you need to be prepared. And then you get this little drip of it in verse 25. A discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. Again, this is a washing thing because they're baptizing and they're saying, why are you baptizing Jews? They wash all the time. They don't need this. And, and, And then you have the woman at the well and Jesus, again, the water theme continues to drip. Get it? The water theme continues to drip. And then what is cool on this piece of like, unless you're born of water and the spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. So in order to be born again, you have to be born of water and the spirit. You have to be consecrated. You have to be, being born again has this idea of being like prepared or, or, or like washed to be in God's presence. And then what do you have in John chapter 13? Jesus goes to wash the disciples' feet. And Peter, he says, Lord, don't just like, Lord, don't wash my feet. You shouldn't do that. And he says, no, 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 I need to wash your feet. If you want to have any part of me, I need to wash your feet. And and Peter says, well, not my feet, but my whole body. And Jesus says, no, 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 I've made you clean already. And it's this affirmation of Peter, you've been born again. You've been born again. You've been washed with water and the spirit. You've been born of water and the spirit. You've been born again. And what does he say? But not all of you but not all of you, thinking about Judas, right? And so there's this picture of this washing, this consecrating, this born of water and the spirit born again that continues to flow through the book of John. There's also this cool picture of wind. Verse eight, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And what he's saying is when you're born again, when you are born again, there's evidence. There's evidence. Just like the wind. You know it's there. It's doing, it's doing what the wind does. It blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't understand it. But there's evidence. And when someone is born again, there will be irrefutable evidence. Just as there are two parents for physical birth, there are two parents for spiritual birth. The Spirit of God and the Word of God. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God, and when the sinner believes, he imparts the life of God. One quote was, a newborn baby cannot be arrested because it has no past. When you're born again into God's family, your sins are forgiven and forgotten, and your future is bright with living hope. New birth is a non-negotiable of discipleship, and at some point, every disciple of Christ must come to that point. It's a non-negotiable. I got you to read Numbers chapter 2, which was a mistake. I just was supposed to put a 1 after that, and I knew that, or I, I, <laughs> I didn't write Numbers chapter 2 on purpose. I wrote, I was meaning to write Numbers chapter 21. How many of you were super confused by that? Did you find it? Okay, I'm sorry. In Numbers chapter 21, you have this, there's sin in the camp of Israel. God sends poisonous snakes into the camp to, to kill everybody. He's not happy. He gets Moses to make a bronze snake and lift it up and wave it around. And people, when they realize, like, I've offended God, they can look to this snake and they can be saved. And so he says, just like that, the Son of Man must be lifted up and you must look to him to be saved. What's cool is that's a picture of God's grace in the midst of the punishment of sin. 
That is, that's really a neat thing. And that's Romans 5. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's grace in the midst of the punishment for sin. And so, last week we talked about this word, true. And I want to just point out, we're not going to get into chapter 4 because we're out of time. But I'm, not, I'm just going to point out the word true from last week from the prologue which is right here, the true light, verse one, chapter 1, verse 9, the true light means ultimate. And so Jesus is the ultimate. And what you have in chapter 4 is Jesus proclaiming, you had water and you thought it was great water because it was Jacob's water, but I am the ultimate. I am the water that you drink and you never have to thirst again. And he has this incredible conversation with this woman. And the end result is that many believe, verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. She said, he told me all that I ever did. And, and he also, in verse 29, she says, come and see this man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And that is cool. I didn't get you to look this up, but the end of Deuteronomy, Moses is saying a farewell to the nation before he goes and dies. And he says, God is going to send someone and he is going to tell you everything. And I think that's what she was thinking of. Come see this man. He told me all that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And, and people believe based on her testimony. The official son, we're not going to talk too much about that, but just incredible faith. You have this guy, somebody who shouldn't even have faith in Christ and expresses more faith than anyone has up to this point. And so we'll just... The thrust of chapter 3 is moving into chapter 4 and preparing your testimony. We need to be aware and motivated by that the world stands condemned apart from Christ. And, and Christ does not condemn the world, but the world condemns itself by their unbelief. And then you have this beautiful woman, this woman receiving beautifully the words of Christ and being born again. And you also have contrasted with Nicodemus, the man who thinks he is not, does, has no need to be born again. And so, as you go into your groups, work through those four questions from this past week. And then also, I'm hoping you have time to share your testimony with each other just a little bit as well. So let me pray for us and away we go. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for the, the word becoming flesh. What a gracious thing you have done. And, and Lord, as we talk about the things we've studied this week. We ask that you would edify each one and encourage each one, we pray. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.